Okay, so we have this problem from the previous video of our, our ship. When we have a spike in a frame, our ship stops, which is okay. If, if we do have a spike in our frame, our ship's going to stop either way. We want to do everything we can to reduce our frame rate so we don't, we don't have these spikes in our frame. But if we do have spikes in frames, longer frames, hopefully not this long, then the ship should pop to where it should originally be according to real time. Right now the ship just continues where it left off and moves forward from there, when really it should jump to where it should have been in real time. How do we fix that? Well, we're going to do that with some timing and some timers. And if you want to stick with frame time for now and skip this part, that's fine. Uh, you may wonder, Jamie, why are we going through timing right now? I was having fun with the vectors. We're getting our ship to move. Can't we keep going? Yes, you can. Skip this video. Calculate according to frame time if you like. But I think it's important early on to be dealing with actual real time and not frame time. Um, but I'm not going to do all timing and profiling stuff here. We'll do that later in the video list. For now, I just want to get a simple, what, what, how much time passed this frame? Let's use that for our math. But before we build a class that actually measures that time and deals with that time, I'm going to show you how the Windows API allows us to measure time. First of all, uh, other APIs, generally I've found working with most APIs, they allow you to measure time in milliseconds, which is basically a thousandth of a second. So say this whole span of line here represents a second, and I do a thousand of these lines. We sample a second once every a thousandth of a second, which is okay, I mean that works, but I we need to get more granular, especially if you think your processor, my CPU speed is 2.5 gigahertz, I'd like to measure uh, each clock cycle, if I could get 2.5 uh, billion, okay, gigahertz is billion, if I can get 2.5 billion samples in a second, then that's much granular, and I can get a lot more fine detail there and that sort of thing. If you think about it, computers are discrete. That's kind of the problem with having discrete machines represent the continuous world that we live in. They're either on, they're off, they're one, two, three, four. That's why floating point values can go off. And if you want to look at the floating point uh, playlist to see why floating points aren't perfect, I highly suggest doing that. Highly educational. But we take these samples, and even 2.5 billion isn't perfect, but it's a lot better than 1,000, a lot more granular. So I want to do that. If you think about the amount of time you get to breathe, I mean, you can breathe whenever you want, but say there was this law, or your body followed this law, where you can breathe here at this point in time, or you can breathe here at this point in time. Well, if the distance between these two points is extremely small, then no problem. But if it's huge, like, say, 10 minutes, then we're going to have to adjust how we use air and consume energy and that sort of thing. So hopefully you see the, see the point that the more granular, the better. If you want to think in terms of sandpaper, coarse sandpaper, you use that to kind of get the big rough edges out. Then after a while, you move to a much finer granularity in sandpaper to, to get more detail, and, and it makes it smoother and prettier. Let me show you how to... I don't, I don't want to measure in milliseconds. I want to measure in my CPU clock. So let me show you how the Windows... The Windows API allows us to interact with that. I'm going to pound include Windows, Windows.h, that comes for free with Windows. It's in your include path. Visual Studio takes care of that for you. Uh, let's do large integer. Okay. Let's look let's look at this thing for example for for a minute, sorry. I'm gonna hit F12 so we can go see what the, how this thing's defined. Looks like they're using some preprocessor magic to switch between struct or union. But if you look at the Union, and if you don't remember what a union is, basically a union says we're going to union these data types into one chunk of RAM. So you can either look at the RAM like this, you can look at the RAM like this, or you can look at the RAM like this. Well, what's the size of one of, the, one of these unions? Well, it's, it's going to be the largest of the three of these. So if this is the largest, then these guys will fill in and so on and so forth. I don't want to review the details of unions. Please uh, go look that up if you need to. Uh, okay, a lot of data types here. They look kind of scary. We've got this D word and long and dummy struct name, D word long and then U. I'm not sure why they have dummy struct name here. I, don't, I think they could take this out and get the same result uh, because this struct down here is the same size as that. And since they take up the exact same bits between the two of them, I think they could have gone away with just this. But whatever. Then they union that with this long, long. All right, now I'm going to guess that a long is a long, long, or long, long is a really long, long. Uh, okay, that's, that hurts to think like that. Let me, um, and, and then notice this union that's underscore large integer. I could say that, or I could say this, either one. 
Uh, if you noticed in my code, I decided to keep the slightly cleaner, not prefixed with an underscore version there. Let's click on quad part here and see, or no, I'm going to click on long, long, hit F12 and see, what, what is long, long defined to be? Oh, there we go. It's type def to an int 64. Oops. Oh, I just messed up my code. It's type def to an underscore, underscore, int 64. Int 64. 64 is 64 bits, and the int part means signed. All right, it's not an unsigned int 64, as we see down here. It is a signed int 64, meaning it can go negative. Underscore int 64 is a Microsoft compiler-specific type. That's why they're using the type def here. If we want to port our code to something else, then that something else has to type def long, long, to be whatever that something else will be. So then when we say, oops, when we say long, long, that's defined for that platform. For the Microsoft compiler, uh, where it's defined to be this int64, which is a nice atomic type, but it's really big. We're generally making ints that are 32 bits long, and that works great, but with these delta times, if you think about it, 2.5 gigahertz, if we're, if we're cycling 2.5 billion times a second, we need a really large number to track that. In fact, let's bring up the calculator here. View, let's go to Programmer. And this is 32 bits right here. Let's say we only have 32 bits. I'm going to fill them up with the largest. I need to go to hex here. I'm going to fill these 32 bits up with the largest signed value that we can have. So there we go. All the bits are turned on except the sign bit. What is that in decimal? Well, that is thousand million billion. After one <laughs> one second, we of CPU cycles, we will exceed this number. All right, we don't. Oh, well, let's see. Thousand million billion. Yeah, we don't. We need a bigger number, and so we actually get a full 64 bits signed still so let me let me go to back to hex here and say do the largest signed 64 bit value that I can do see all these bits are filling in with ones as I hit F so what is that in in decimal well that's much bigger than a billion it's let's see thousand million billion trillion I don't know and I don't know I'd have to go Google that but plenty of room to calculate uh, our cycles per second. So that's why we're using int 64s here. Okay, let me, let me go back to large integer here. Hit F12. So what's a long long? This quad part? Let me click here, hit F12. Oh, I just did that. Sorry. Not long long. What's a D word? Well, a D word, if I hit F12, it's an unsigned long. All right, now a word, we're used to bytes being 8 bits. And a word, it depends on the architecture. On my architecture, a word is 16 bits. So a D word is is uh, 2 double. 2 times 16 is 32, so that's 32 bits. So to get a 32-bit signed value, it's, or unsigned value, it's going to be unsigned long. All right, now, it just so happens that a long and an int on my platform uh, are the same size. They're both 32 bits. And they're both signed unless you explicitly say unsigned. So we have this we have this unsigned part here, but then we have this long head of twelve on that, and long, capital long, is type def to be a long, which is a signed long. So this 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 is getting confusing. Holy smokes. Let's let me see if I can draw this out a little bit. We have a we know we have sixty four bits, which is going to be eight bytes. So let me draw one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, let's see, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and let me just get rid of the stuff on the end. So we have eight bytes or 64 bits of information. And the way this union's working out is the low part will read right to left. For example, if I have a thousand dollars, that's different than having one dollar like so so the least significant bit we'll put on the right here the the low part here is going to be our unsigned part so we're going to take these four bytes and treat them unsigned all right there's no no negative values in here but then this high part we're treating as signed that's the next four 
bytes, and we have the sign bit right here. So we can either look at an instance of one of these large integer types. Uh, we can look at the individual low part and high part via this U data member, or we can just say dot quad part and get the whole thing instead. All right? This way, we low part, high part, we look at the individual slices. Quad part gives us the whole thing. All right? I hope I didn't confuse you too much there. So let's let's go back. Let's, maybe that's way too much info than you wanted, but I think these things are kind of interesting. Let me close this. Close this. Large integer clock frequency. Query performance, control space, there's query performance counter, query performance frequency. The frequency returns how many cycles do we get per second. Let me open that with a parenthesis. Notice it returns a boolean indicating whether the query was successful or not. Uh, on your platform the query is either going to succeed or it's not. You can either query this register on your CPU that keeps track of the number of ticks that is passed, or you cannot. So that's why that boolean's there. We're not going to check it quite yet because I know I can do that. But to, and then we have the frequency here. So this frequency here, remember it's here we go, large integer. So we need to pass a pointer to a frequency. This is an output parameter. So we're going to pass the address to our clock frequency there. Close that. Uh, let's put a breakpoint down here. Hit a five. This should be exciting. Clock frequency is. Let's look at that. Low part. Look at the high part there is zero. So nothing got past the 32-bit line. And the low part is two four three three five three five. Well, think about that for a minute. Two four three three five three five. If that's dollars, how big is that? That's two million four hundred thousand four hundred three. And thirty-three thousand five thirty-five dollars. So, roughly two point five, two point five million. Let's see, two point five million hertz. Now, you're probably thinking, Jamie, you just said you had a two point five gigahertz CPU, and we're measuring in millions of hertz. In fact, the reason why we had looked at the high part and the low part, and we did all that stuff on the calculator, is because we needed to count gigahertz, not megahertz. Well, <laughs> this is the best that we can get on my computer as far as samples. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean my CPU is running at 2.5 megahertz instead of 2.5 gigahertz. Believe me, I would notice a difference. But that's how often the CPU increments this counter per second, this register. So maybe that makes sense, maybe it doesn't, but that's a lot more granularity than than with milliseconds or just a thousand samples. I'll take 2.4 million samples. I would like 2.4 billion samples, but 2.4 million samples is fine. I actually did a little research on, on the side with this one. Uh, check this out. Let me show you what I found. So I found this forum here where this gentleman looks like back in 2009. says, I did this test function on two PCs, Intel dual core 3.6 gigahertz and 1.6 gigahertz. Now I'm not worried too much worried about the 3.6 and the 1.6. I'm worried that both are in gigahertz. Okay, and he he uh, queried his frequency, and he says for number one, the 3.6, he gets 3.6 gigahertz. All right, but for number two, it gives him a much smaller number, which looks like it's about 3.5 megahertz. And then I did some reading in the documentation online about query performance counter and yada yada yada. And essentially it's it's CPU ticks. But what's a CPU tick? Is it a real actual tick or is it a register that they wanted to it looks like in my case, if you look at the clock frequency here, it's roughly two point five, but it's two point five megahertz, not two point five gigahertz. So maybe every thousand clock cycles they come around and they increment this register who knows it's more granular than a thousand though so I'll take it uh, in the next video uh, I'm gonna continue this on show you how to query the current time and to get a delta time and then be able to measure that time by by taking those measurements and doing some division and so on and so forth